Chapter 10 of The Airlords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Life in Lo Tan the Magnificent. Sanlon's attitude toward me underwent a change. He did not seek my company as he had done before, and so those long discussions and mental duels in which we pitted our philosophies against each other came to an end. I was, I suspected, an unpleasant reminder to him of things he would rather forget, and my presence was an omen of impending doom. That he did not order my execution forthwith was due, I believe, to a sort of fascination in me, as the personification of this, to him, strange and mysterious race of supermen who had so magically developed overnight from beasts of the forest. But though I saw little of him after this, I remained a member of his household, if one may speak of a household where there is no semblance of house. The imperial apartments were located at the very summit of the imperial tower, the topmost pinnacle of the city, itself clinging to the sides and peak of the highest mountain in that section of the Rockies. There were days when the city seemed to be built on a rugged island in the midst of a sea of fleecy whiteness, for frequently the cloud level was below the peak. And on such days, the only visual communications with the world below was through the viewplates which formed nearly all the interior walls of the thousands of apartments, for the city was, in fact, one vast building, and upon which the tenants could tune in almost any views they wished from an elaborate system of public television and projectoscope broadcasts. Every Han city had many public view broadcasting stations, operating on tuning ranges which did not interfere with the other communication systems. For slight additional fees a citizen in Lotan might, if he felt so inclined, visit the seashore, or the lakes or the forests of any part of the country, for when such scene was thrown on the walls of an apartment, the effect was precisely the same as if one were gazing through a vast window at the scene itself. It was possible, too, for a slightly higher fee, to make a mutual connection between apartments in the same or different cities, so that a family in Lotan, for instance, might visit friends in Fisco, San Francisco, taking their apartment, so to speak, along with them, being to all intents and purposes separated from their hosts only by a big glass wall which interfered neither with vision nor conversation. These public view and visitation projectoscopes explain that utter depth of laziness into which the Hans had been dragged by their civilization. There was no incentive for anyone to leave his apartment unless he was in the military or air service, or a member of one of the repair services which from time to time had to scoot through the corridors and shafts of the city, somewhat like the ancient fire departments, to make some emergency repair to the machinery of the city or its electrical devices. Why should he leave his house? Food, wonderful synthetic concoctions of any desired flavor and consistency, and for additional fee conforming to the individual's dietary prescription, came to him through a shaft, from which his tray slid automatically onto a convenient shelf or table. At will he could tune in a theatrical performance of talking pictures, he could visit and talk with his friends. He breathed the freshest of filtered air right in his own apartment. At any temperature he desired, fragrant with the scent of flowers, the aromatic smell of the pine forests, or the salt tang of the ocean, as he might prefer. He could visit his friends at will, and though his apartment might actually be buried many thousand feet from the outside wall of the city, it was nonetheless an outside one, by virtue of its viewplate walls. There was even a tube system, with trunk, branch, and local lines, and an automagnetic switching system, by which articles within certain size limits could be dispatched from any apartment to any other one in the city. The women actually moved about through the city more than the men, for they had no fixed duties. No work was required of them, and though nominally free, their dependence upon the government pension for their necessities, and on their husbands of the moment, for their luxuries, reduced them virtually to the condition of slaves. Each had her own apartment in the lower city, with but a single small viewplate, very limited visitation facilities, and a minimum credit for food and clothing. This apartment was assigned to her on graduation from the state school, in which she had been placed as an infant, 
and it remained hers so long as she lived, regardless of whether she occupied it or not. At the conclusion of her various marriages, she would return there, pending her endeavors to make a new match. Naturally, as her years increased, her returns became more frequent and her stay of longer duration, until finally abandoning hope of making another match, she finished out her days there, usually in drunkenness and whatever other forms of cheap dissipation she could afford on her dole, starving herself. Men also received the same state pension, sufficient for the necessities, but not for the luxuries of life. They got it only as an old age pension and on application. When boys graduated from the state school, they generally were adopted by their fathers and taken into the latter's households, where they enjoyed luxuries far in excess of their own earning power. It was not that their fathers wasted any affection on them, for as I have explained before, the Hans were so morally atrophied and scientifically developed that love and affection, as we Americans knew them, were unexperienced or suppressed emotions with them. They were replaced by lust and pride of possession. So long as it pleased a father's vanity, and he did not miss the cost, he would keep a son with him, but no longer. Young men, of course, started to work at the minimum wage, which was somewhat higher than the pension. There was work for everybody in positions of minor responsibility, but very little hard work. Upon receiving his appointment from one or other of the big corporations which handled the production and distribution of the vast community, the shares of which were pooled and held by the government, that is, by San Lan himself, in trust for all the workers according to their positions. He would be assigned to an apartment office, or an apartment adjoining the group of offices in which he was to have his desk. Most of the work was done in single apartment offices. The young man, for instance, might recline at his ease in his apartment near the top of the city, and for three or four hours a day inspect, through his viewplate and certain specially installed apparatus, the output of a certain process in one of the vast automatically controlled food factories, buried far underground beneath the base of the mountain, where the moan of its whirring and throbbing machinery would not disturb the peace and quiet of the citizens on the mountaintop, or he might be required simply to watch the operation of an account machine in an automatic store. There is no denying that the economic system of the Hans was marvelous. A suit of clothes, for instance, might be delivered in a man's apartment without a human hand having ever touched it. Having decided that he wished a suit of a given general style, he would simply tune in a visual broadcast of the display of various selections, and when he had made his choice, dial the number of the item and press the order button. Simultaneously, the charge would be automatically made against his account number and credited as a sale on the automatic records of that particular factory in the account house. And his account plate, hidden behind a little wall door, would register his new credit balance, an automatically packaged suit that had been made to style and size standard by automatic machinery from synthetically produced material, would slip into the delivery chute, magnetically addressed, and in anywhere from a few seconds to thirty minutes or so, according to the volume of business in the chutes, and drop into the delivery basket in his room. Daily his wages were credited to his account and monthly his share of the dividends likewise, according to his position, from the Imperial Investment Trust, after deduction of taxes through the automatic bookkeeping machines, for the support of the city's pensioners and whatever sum San Lan himself had chosen to deduct for personal expenses and gratuities. A man could not bequeath his ownership interest in industry to his son, for that interest ceased with his death, but his credit accumulation, on which interest was paid, was credited to his eldest recorded son as a matter of law. Since many of these credit fortunes, the Hans had abandoned gold as a financial basis centuries before, were so big that they drew interest in excess of the utmost luxury costs of a single individual. There was a class of idle rich consisting of eldest sons passing on these credit fortunes from generation to generation. But younger sons and women had no share in these fortunes, except by the whims in favor of the Mandins, Mandarins, as these inheritors were known. These Mandins formed a distinct class of the population, and numbered about 5% of it. It was distinct from the Kuli, or common people, and from the Qiling, 
or aristocracy composed of those more energetic men, at least mentally more energetic, who were the active or retired executive heads of the various industrial, educational, military, or political administrations. A man might, if he so chose, transfer part of his credit to a woman favorite, which then remained hers for life or until she used it up, and of course the prime object of most women, whether as wives or favorites, was to beguile a settlement of this sort out of some wealthy man. When successful in this, and upon reassuming her freedom, a woman ranked socially and economically with the Mandans, but on her death whatever remained of her credit was transferred to the imperial fund. When one considers that the Hans, from the days of their exodus from Mongolia and their conquest of America, had never held any ideal of monogamy, and the fact that marriage was but a temporary formality which could be terminated on official notice by either party, and that after all it gave a woman no real rights or prerogatives that could not be terminated at the whim of her husband, and established her as nothing but the favorite of his harem, if he had an income large enough to keep one, or the most definitely acknowledged of his favorites if he hadn't, it is easy to see that no such thing as a real family life existed among them. Free women roamed the quarters of the city, pathetically importuning marriage, and wives spent most of the time they were not under their husband's watchful eyes in flirtatious attempts to provide themselves with better prospects for their next marriages. Naturally, the biggest problem of the community was that of stimulating the birth rate. The system of special credits to mothers had begun centuries before, but had not been very efficacious until women had been deprived of all other earning power and even at the time of which I write, it was only partially successful, in spite of the heavy bounties for children. It was difficult to make the bounties sufficiently attractive to lure the women from the more remunerative light flirtations. Eugenic standards also were a handicap. As a matter of fact, San Lan had under consideration a revolutionary change in economic and moral standards, when the revolt of the forest men upset his delicately laid plans. For, as he had explained to me, it was no easy thing to upset the customs of centuries in what he was pleased to call the morals of his race. He had another reason, too. The physically active men of the community were beginning to acquire a rather dangerous domination. These included men in the army, in the airships, and in those relatively few civilian activities in which machines could not do the routine work and thinking. Already common soldiers and air crews demanded and received higher remuneration than all except the highest of the Qi Ling, the industrial and scientific leaders, while mechanics and repairmen who could and would work hard physically commanded higher incomes than princes of the blood. And though constituting only a fraction of one percent of the population, they actually dominated the city. San Lan dared take no important step in the development of the industrial and military system without consulting their council or union, union, as it was known. Socially, the Han cities were in a chaotic condition at this time, between morals that were not morals, families that were not families, marriages that were not marriages, children who knew no homes, work that was not work, eugenics that didn't work, coolies who envied the richer classes but were too lazy to reach out for the rewards freely offered for individual initiative, the intellectually active and physically lazy Qi Lings, who despised their lethargy, the Mandin drones, who regarded both classes with supercilious toleration, the princes of the blood, arrogant in their assumption of a heritage from a heaven in which they did not believe, and finally the three castes of the army, air, and industrial repair services, equally arrogant and with more reason in their consciousness of physical power. The army exercised a cruelly careless and impartial police power over all classes, including the airmen when the latter were in port. But it did not dare to touch the repairmen, who, so far as I could ever make out, roamed the corridors of the city at will during their hours off duty, wreaking their wills on whomever they met, without let or hindrance. Even a prince of the blood would withdraw into a side corridor with his escort of a score of men, to let one of these labor kings pass, rather than risk an altercation which might result in trouble for the government with the Union, regardless of the rights and wrongs of the case, unless a heavy credit transference was made from a balance of the prince to that of the worker. 
for the machinery of the city could not continue in operation a fortnight before some accident requiring delicate repair work would put it partially out of commission, and the union was quick to resent anything it could construe as a slight on one of its members. In the last analysis, it was these union men, numerically the smallest of the classes, who ruled the Han civilization, because for all practical purposes they controlled the machinery on which that civilization depended for its existence. Politically, San Lan could balance the organizations of the army and the air fleets against each other, but he could not break the grip of the repairmen on the machinery of the cities and the power broadcast plants. End of chapter 10